Before we get into today's video, I do want to let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comments section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope everybody is having a wonderful 2021 so far. Man, that sounds absolutely bonkers to me. Am I the only one? I mean, I know I was born in the 80s. Some of y'all were born in 2000, you know, 2001. So it may not seem so far-fetched to you or so crazy, but like me born in the 80s, like 2021. Did anybody else think that we were gonna have cars flying by this time, like the whole fifth element like dimension thing? Anyway, so in today's video, we are gonna be talking about the story about Lorena Bobbitt and John Wayne Bobbitt. Have y'all heard of this? Now, when I was growing up, there were so many rumors about this, and I'm gonna tell you guys some later. And I learned a lot researching this case, and it is a very intriguing story. Very, very intriguing story. So let's just start at the beginning. In 1967, John Wayne Bobbitt was born. He was raised in New York. His father just basically disappeared on him. He never had a relationship with his father, never even really knew who his father was. His mother, on the other hand, was an addict and was not around a lot. She was in and out of, you know, the streets and stuff. And when John was asked about his mother, he said she was a really nice lady, but she basically just had issues. So John's aunt and uncle took in him and his brother. John said there was a lot of fighting going on, which I could only assume. You know, there was a lot of drinking out of the milk jugs, a lot of not putting the toilet seat down. And he also said that he went to church on Sundays with his family. And then later on in his life, he ended up joining the Marines. Now, when John was asked why he joined the Marines, he basically said, well, my friends were doing it. So I did it too. Now let's talk about Lorena Bobbitt. Lorena Bobbitt was born in Ecuador in 1969. And then when she was about seven years old, she moved with her parents to Venezuela. Now her parents stayed married, were married the whole entire time. She did have siblings. And when asked about Lorena's childhood, she said that they were happy. They were very, very, very poor, but they loved, you know, they, they, had, a, they had a home full of love. She was raised very strict Catholic, like very strict. There was all these different pictures of her, like all the little girls had on white dresses with veils and like, it was strict, honey, to the point that even when she was older, she could not date without a chaperone until she got married. Very, very strict, but very, very loving. Lorena said that as a child, she used to watch American TV and she used to love it. She would see like all these game shows and stuff. She would watch The Price is Right. Any of y'all remember The Price is Right? And she would be, you know, in her country and she would people like see people winning cars and clapping and winning $10,000. And she just thought like America was so amazing. The American dream, the land of the free. And she always dreamed of coming here. Well, when she was 16, she took a trip here just to visit and then whenever she was 18 she got a student visa and was able to come over here to go to college and she was so happy to finally be in America. In 1988 at a marine military ball is when John met Lorena. According to Lorena she said John was so handsome he was just so good looking he had his uniform on and Lorena was described by John as very shy, very timid, very innocent. And she didn't speak super good English at the time, but she was beautiful. And they supposedly just had chemistry right off of the bat. They danced all night long. John asked her to dance first and they just had a really good time. Nine months later in 1989, the two wed, they got married. Now, while they were dating, she thought he was the perfect guy for her. I mean, she had to have a chaperone and she felt she, she was telling like her aunt and stuff that she lived with in the, in the States. Like, 
I'm an adult. Like, I don't need a chaperone. And her aunt was saying, no, your parents will literally, they'll take me out. Like, you have to have a chaperone. So here she is, this grown woman, okay? And she's got somebody following her around every time she goes on a date. Now, people, her friends and stuff that was chaperoning already kind of had a weird vibe about John. He was very charismatic, though, honey. He was, like, very flirty and very confident sounding. But he always seemed to leave his wallet at home every time they went on a date. And Lorena paid for everything. So her chaperones, which were friends and stuff like that, would be like, don't you think it's weird that he always leaves his wallet at home but she was head over heels honey she was in love she didn't want to hear none of that she to her it was like so what he left his wallet at home I got it I'll pay for it and that's just how things went so in 1989 when they got married they had different stories about the proposal John says she proposed to him which I don't believe but that that's his story I'll let him tell it and Lorena says that he proposed to her Nevertheless, they got married and she just felt like she was living the all American dream. She, she, now she was married to a military guy, you know, a Marine. And he was so handsome and charismatic and, you know, waited for her until marriage, which she had never been with anybody, never had another boyfriend before. This was her first of everything. So she was so happy. Unfortunately, all of the honeymoon stage came to a screeching halt very, very quickly. Within the first month, John started allegedly, according to Lorena, becoming physical with her. He would, you know, yell at her and just kind of put her down. It was something she was totally shocked by. She'd never seen her father treating her mom like that. And now here's this guy that she's absolutely in love with and he's starting to act differently. She said the first time that he put his hands on her was when they were leaving a bar. John loved to drink, like he always wanted to go out drinking. And it was him, his brother, in the car and Lorena and John was driving, his brother was in the back seat and Lorena was in the passenger seat. And John was super intoxicated driving way past the limit, allegedly for entertainment purposes only. And Lorena said he was swerving into the other car. So she grabbed the steering wheel. She was begging him not to drive, but he, he wasn't having that. And when she grabbed the steering wheel, he started punching her and like punched her in her chest. She said she cried the whole entire way home. So that was within the first month of them being married. Stuff like that continued to happen. And then in 1991, John was discharged from the military. Now, I couldn't find anything about honorably discharged or just discharged. And I would really love to know exactly what happened for him to be discharged from the Marines at that. Like, what did you do, sir? And listen, that doesn't mean everybody that gets discharged from the military did something terrible, but researching his personality, that's my mind goes straight to there. I'm judging. Anyway, so after he was discharged from the military, he could not find a job. And when he did find a job, he could not hold it down. At this time, Lorena, she's working two jobs, okay? She started off being a nanny for this woman named Jana Basati. And Jana was like this single mother, honey. She had all these nail salons. She was a businesswoman. She had it together. She had this beautiful, nice house. She dressed to a nine all the time. Makeup done, lashes on, honey. She had her hair done, suits all the time. And Lorena just really looked up to her and she said to her one time while she was nannying before she started her second job she was like how do you do this like how and Jana basically said to her you got to work real hard and she said well I want to work real hard like you can I have a job at one of your nail salons and Jana said sure I'll train you so she taught her how to be a manicurist Lorena was being a nanny with her children during the daytime and then when she would leave that job she would go do nails at the salon while John sat at home, basically. John drank a lot, a whole lot, spent a lot of money. In 1991, Lorena became pregnant with her husband John's baby. She was so excited. She wanted to be a mother. And you gotta think too, she was nannying for, for years. So she was doing the whole mother thing already in, you know, in her way. I mean, being a nanny is different than being a full-time mother, but still, I mean, it's, you get a feel of whether you want to be a mommy or not when you're taking care of somebody else's kids. Trust me. Okay, you do. 
Anyways, so she wanted to be a mom so bad and he was telling her for the longest time that he wanted to have a kid with her. But when she came to him and told him that she was pregnant, he lost his mind. He started yelling at her, telling her, we're not ready to have a kid. We're not financially stable, all that. Although she's the only one that's working. He was asking her like, what do you, you got to work. You've got to work. What do you expect? How, how do you expect to be able to take care of a kid? And she was like, well, I'll stay home and you can get a job. And he was like, basically like, honey, Mm -mm. So he started telling her, he picked up a phone book, he takes it to the yellow pages and he shows her like an abortion clinic. And he was like, this is where you need to go. And Lorena tells him, I'm not having no abortion. Like, are you crazy? And he goes, either you can have this abortion or you're losing me. I'll pack up my stuff now and I will divorce you and you can be a single mom. I'm not going to help you. Now you guys got to remember, this is, this is back in, you know, the 1990s there wasn't all of these hotlines and stuff that they have now and plus she was from another country she had lived grew up a different way over there her parents stayed together were together forever and she just she didn't want to lose her husband even though he was being a complete butthead to her she kept believing in him and believing that he was going to change nevertheless she he talked her into it or threatened her she felt like she had no other choice and she, he, she made an appointment and he drove her down to the clinic. When she got to the clinic to have this procedure, he was sitting in the waiting room with her and he was laughing at her. He was making her cry. She was sitting there crying and shaking so bad that the nurse had to come in and get her and take her away from him, bring her into a room and give her something to calm her down and then stay away from him because he was just like picking on her and I don't know, man, you guys, it's just, it's pretty disgusting when you think about it. She went through with the abortion and she went on about her life with him. The abuse continued with John. I could sit here for a 30 minutes and just tell you guys different stories, different scenarios, but we'll skate by it fewly with this. Like he, he was messing with other women allegedly. Okay. She said she would come home from work, working all day long at these double jobs. And like he would be in the apartment complex in other girls' rooms and stuff like that, other women's rooms. And she would be scared to confront him about it. Or if she did, it was a full fight. One time her mother came to visit. Now her mother's coming from another country. They're living in this point in a house that basically she's pretty much working and paying for, but, but nevertheless, he's sitting there watching football. And they're cooking in the kitchen, her and her mom, and she's so excited and he's watching the game and he's coming in there wooing them and, you know, just kissing the mom and, you know, making the mom feel all happy. You know, she's seeing her daughter happy. And then she wants to change the channel because her mom is in town. She wanted to show her mom the Macy's Day Parade. And when she did, he completely flipped out on her. He embarrassed her in front of her mother he, and then her mother being who she was, was like, why would you upset him? And that again, reinforced it in her mind that there was something wrong with her. He would say things to her like she was, you know, fat and she, her, her butt was too wide or she was too skinny or she was ugly or nobody was ever going to want her. And that and she told him over and over again, like you cannot get me sent back to my country. Cause he would always threaten her with that. And she would say, you can't do that. I was already in this country before I married you. And he goes, I'm an American. I'm an American. You're not. I will get you sent back to your country. And when he would like, he would leave her sometimes for two or three days at a time, he would take all of her paperwork, like her paperwork from where she was, you know, had to come over to the country, like her visa and stuff like that, and just completely freak her out. And she was scared all the time, really. But also at the same time, she did not want to leave him. Now there was different times where cops were called because neighbors heard him yelling at her or heard what sounded like fighting and stuff. And one time a police officer came there and he opened the door and he could smell the alcohol on John's breath. And John, of course, tried to tell him, oh, there's nothing going on. And he saw, he saw Lorena and he called her out and they, they made a report and all of that. One time he was arrested for abuse. And eventually during this time, and this is where I'm going to let you guys know that things are going to, if you're sensitive to things like, um, assault in, you know, certain ways and stuff like that, like we're going to be talking about that and different things. So if you're super sensitive, this is your trigger warning, probably should exit the video now. 
he started where he would like be going out all night drinking and she would, she would have worked all day long, you know, came home, cleaned, cooked, whatever. She goes to bed and he would come in and he would force himself upon her. Right. And not just even the way, but anally. And she would be bleeding and crying and he would hold her down and he would like hit her. And there was one time she went to go file a police report and she sat there and she was having, you guys got to understand, she was raised very, very, very strict Catholic. They didn't talk about stuff like this back then. You know, you didn't, you, it was hard for her to say the words out loud of what exactly what was happening. And when she went into the police station here in America, they want to know every detail, right? And after she told him every detail, then the guy tells her, you need to come back in three hours because my secretary's not here. She's like, I can't come back in three hours. I'll be getting, I have to go back to work. I'll get off work. He'll wonder where I am. And he was like, you have to come back. So she left and she never came back. So little things like that. She tried to report, she tried to get help, but she just never was able to get the help that she needed. And for whatever reason, she did not have the strength to completely walk away and not come back. Again, being because of her culture, being because her faith, whatever, being it, it being because she was just an abused woman whose self-esteem was totally ran into the ground and she did not have any belief or love for herself, whatever it was, she did not leave him. And I think we've, a lot of us have been in situations with, in relationships with men or women that we should have been gone a long time ago and we stayed because we believe that person could change. And then, you know, the good times would be good for a minute. You guys know she was in that situation. The night of the incident, here we go. June 23rd of 1993, okay. John is with his friend out drinking. Now at this point, John had told her that his friend needed to come stay for a couple weeks. And when his friend comes in, she was like, okay, he's going to, I'm going to make you a spot on the couch. And he goes, no, I'm going to build him a room inside of our apartment. And she was like, but he's only staying a couple weeks. The friend was like, you told me I could live here. It was like this whole entire drama. And when she said, live here, you didn't tell me that. Then of course, John starts yelling at her in front of him. And like, why would you hurt? Like, just took it all out on her, made her feel like she had done something wrong. And they leave to go out drinking. Well, she goes to sleep. John comes in around 4 a.m. in the morning, drunker than a skunk, honey. Now to hear him tell it, he said he only had a couple beers and a couple shots. His friend that was with him later testified that he had like five beers, multiple shots. He was, he was, he was two sheets to the wind or however you say that. And he comes in in the bed with her and he starts to assault her yet again, okay? And she would always cry to him and say, why are you, why would you do this to me? It hurts, you know, she would be bleeding, she would be scared, and he would always tell her, it doesn't matter, you're my wife. I can have it whenever I want it. And if you leave me, I will sit outside your work. I will always take it. And he would tell his friends, there was like different people he played basketball with and stuff, that he would actually brag to him that he loved forced sex. Like he, he wanted it where it was forced and it was painful for her. And that's, that's what turned him on was that type of way, right? So he did her like that again. And she was laying in the bed, shaking, crying, and he rolled over and passed out, went to sleep, whatever. Time goes on, he rolls over on his back, whatever. And she goes into the kitchen to get a glass of water. When she opens the refrigerator, ooh, the light from the refrigerator shines on this big knife that's sitting on the counter. She said she was drinking the water, looking at the knife, and all of these things was going through her mind. The first time he hit her, the second time he hit her, the him telling her she could never get away. He was always going to take it from her, that he was always going to do this. She takes the knife. She goes into the bedroom where he's at. She pulls his Johnson up, and she slices it off. Okay? She takes it and the knife and she leaves the house. She's driving down the road. She's freaking out. She's got blood on her. She's got his member in one hand, honey. And she got the knife in the other. She's trying to drive like this. Like, oh my gosh. Like, whoa, right? He was so drunk. He laid there bleeding for a minute. He didn't even really realize what happened until the blood became so much and he felt himself getting wet. But he wasn't drunk according to him. 
Anyway, so he gets up out of the bed because he wants to go wake up his friend to drive him to the hospital. He is drunk. There was actually a spot on the carpet to where it was like a V-shaped where you could tell his legs were there and he was just like squirting blood out of where his thing used to be, okay? So he goes in there, he starts kicking his friend. His friend's so drunk. His friend gets up and brushes his teeth, finally gets him to the hospital and... You guys, the hospital is freaking out. They'd never seen anything like this. They said like different nurses and doctors testified to when they went into the room, they had this man laying on the stretcher and he's butt naked. And the only thing they see is his like, I don't know. And then it completely gone, like cut, cut down to the, to the, to the pelvic bone. Okay. It's completely gone. And the nurses testified later to saying like they thought, Man, what did he do? He had to really, nobody had seen anything like this before. Now, when the 911 dispatchers were talking to each other, this is back in the 19, early 1990s. Like there was, you know, they were, they were afraid to say anything. So they're saying, we're looking for an appendix because they started looking for the members. So you got all these cops now that are looking for the guy's junk. If you know what I mean? I don't know how to say this, you guys. I know you probably think I'm being very immature, but this is YouTube, okay? Come sit in my living room. I'll tell you the whole story and I won't hold back. Okay, but we're going to keep it as PG-13 as, no. This is rated R. I don't know. What do you guys think? Anyways, so you got all the police looking for his member. Like, they're freaking out. And this most of them are men, too. So they're like, oh my gosh. Everybody's starting to think about their wives and how much, oh my gosh, they probably went home and cleaned the whole entire house for their wife. Like, baby, I love you. Just don't ever... You know, anyways, Lorena, she was so out of it and just, you know, whatever. She pulls over on the side of the road where there's a 7-Eleven and she throws it out the window, honey. And then she gets somewhere else and she puts a knife in a trash can. And then she goes to her friend's house, the woman who owns the salons. And when she opened the door that, that night, it was at nighttime, and she saw the blood all over. She was like, oh my gosh, what happened? They ended up calling the cops. And so the cops came and got her and took her to the hospital too. So they could do an R kit on her. And they were questioning her about stuff. And she was saying all kinds of stuff. She said, he's so selfish. You know, he... He always finishes too when we do do it and doesn't let me finish. Like, girl, you didn't need to say that right then and there. You could have held that back, okay? That was unnecessary. Not the time, okay? Definitely an important topic, okay? But not this is not the time for that one. We'll talk about that later, okay? But, she, you know, she didn't know no better. She was just letting it all spill out. So they did the R kit on her, all of that stuff. And they asked her where the member was. And she told them where it was, y'all. When the police went there to go look through the uh, grass to find this thing, literally this thing, one of the police stepped on it. Oh my gosh, he steps on it and he was so traumatized. These are all men out there looking for it, okay? He starts yelling at the other guys. He's like, it's right here. It's right here. I, I, it's, it's here. It's right here. Like he couldn't even bend down and pick it up. One of the other guys, they come, they pick it up, they they go inside the 7-Eleven, y'all. They put it inside a hot dog bag. Help, help, I cannot believe this really happened, and put ice on it. They take it to the hospital, and he undergoes surgery for nine and a half hours. That is a long time to be under anesthesia. Nine and a half hours to reattach his member to his body, okay? And they said... I don't know how much I should actually say here. They said that once they got it reattached, that it filled up with blood. Like, <laughs> this guy, like, this is crazy. I bet he, I mean, sure he's happy in the long run. And they knew that it would, it would take time to find out if it would ever work again because originally the doctors were planning on doing surgical procedure on him to make sure that he could just go to the bathroom. They said they were planning on him having to sit to go pee for the rest of his life, but they were able to find the member. Thankfully, she told them where it was. She didn't have to. She could have told them she forgot, okay? She could have threw it in a lake. Honey, what if she would have thrown it in the ocean? Okay, fish, you know, what, what would he have done? So he needs to be thankful, okay, for that part, I guess. I don't know. Ooh, help. Anyways, so they reattach it. All is good. Now, of course, 
there becomes a huge media frenzy. This thing goes viral. People are talking about this in all over the world and they're making big jokes about it. I mean, there was, it was on Saturday Night Live, Whoopi Goldberg, she was doing stand-up comedians back then. You know, like everybody was talking about this. Robin Williams, like it was just, it was everywhere. I mean, it was the Lorena Bobbitt story where she cut off whatever. I mean, I heard so many rumors about this when I was a kid. I heard that a woman walking her dog found it. <laughs> I mean, I heard so much stuff. I heard a really big rumor that was true. And I'm going to be telling you guys that part in a minute. Long story short, he goes to trial, okay, for marital R word, right? And back then the law was if you lived together, it couldn't be that. If you lived separately, it could or something like that. And Lorena was like, so you mean to tell me that he was right? that if he's married to me and lives in the house with me, he can take it whenever time, whenever he wants. And basically that's the way the law was set up back then. So women were supporting Lorena, you know, when they, when her story got out, there were some women that weren't, of course. I mean, it's not all one-sided. There was men that supported her too. Um, and there was people that supported John Bobbitt, believe it or not, lots of people. There was people that were saying that they didn't care how much he abused her, that she should never have went there and cut off a man's manhood. And a matter of fact, his brother gave an interview and said that when they found out this happened, all the brothers went looking for her. And if they would have found her, they would have taken her out because you don't cut off the most important thing to a man. And I'm thinking that's the most important thing to a man. Like I would think like your life would probably be up there pretty high up there. I mean, I understand that's important too, but like your life, maybe your family, maybe your children, like, but no, that's the most important thing to a man. So, okay, let's keep going. So he actually ends up getting off. It was completely thrown out for him. He was acquitted. That's the word, acquitted of his of his charges. And then she went to trial and her trial was televised, honey, and it was a big big deal. But there's so many people that came and testified on her behalf that either saw him abusing her, saw the bruises all over her. There was cops that came and testified that she did try to get help. And then of course she testified in the best part of it. And you can find a lot of these like trials and stuff on YouTube, but you can also find like a lot of the trials and stuff on Amazon. There's, there's a Lorena. It's on Amazon. It's a four part series. It's very, very good. You guys go watch it. I really enjoyed watching it, but they got John up there on the stand and they caught him in so many lies. And you could just look at this woman and tell, and, and remember you guys, this is back in the 1990s. It's not like she could look up online how to fake you know, a trial or how to fix, she, there's no way she could have. There was nothing back then to, so all of her reactions were genuine. And he came and sat his butt up in that courtroom and stared her down the whole entire time. And she's already traumatized. Listen, I'm trying, I mean, I know that I should show him some sympathy too in some aspects, I guess, but let me just finish that. Like he, he was a butthead, not only before, but also after. Like, so I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of, uh, sympathy for him. I'm sorry. I don't. She was later found not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. So what that meant was from all the abuse, from everything she had went through, she went insane for a split second, cut off his member, did all of that. And so she was found innocent, which was really amazing because her lawyers at first were trying to get her to take a plea deal where she would admit she premeditated it and she would only have had to serve four months in prison. And if she went, took it to trial and was found guilty, then she would have had 20 years in prison. And she refused to admit that she planned it, which, man, it that really, like, I admire that about her because I know me. I mean, you get in those situations and they're saying you're going to get 20 years or four months. Most people, they take the charge. They admit it whether they did it or not because they're afraid of that 20 years but she didn't. And thankfully she didn't because she was found innocent by reason of temporary insanity. Okay. So now we got all that out, right? You guys, this is the crazy juicy part. This man, 
Y'all, you wanna know where they are now? Let me just tell you where Lorena is, okay? Lorena, in the late 1990s, met a man named David, and they've been together well over 20 years now. They're not married, however, but they are together, and they've been together for all this time. And they have a daughter together named Olivia. So she's happy. She also started a foundation named the Lorena's Red Wagon, which is for women that suffer domestic violence, abuse, and stuff like that, which I think is absolutely amazing and beautiful. And so so that's what she's doing. John Bobbitt, on the other hand, currently right now, allegedly for the most recent thing that I could find, which was early 2020 from, from what I found, he is living in Las Vegas, not working again, you know, whatever, May, maybe whatever, because he won a lawsuit back in years ago. He won some lawsuit from getting in a car accident. So he's living in Las Vegas, not working. He's been married and divorced three times now. And yeah, now the interesting thing, and I heard about this when I was a kid and I thought, I believed it. And then I thought, no, nah, it can't be true, but it is true. This man, y'all, John Bobbitt, put out a darn prano, you know what I mean? Videos, explicit videos, right? Put out a darn prano like six months or whatever afterwards named John Wayne Bobbitt Uncut, y'all uncut i cannot i cannot do it i cannot uncut and most people watched it just because they wanted to see if it still works i mean come on any of you guys been watching this y'all were thinking it we were all thinking it okay well he did that and then later howard stern invited him on his show do any of y'all remember howard stern any of my a little bit older generation like you have to stay up real late and sneak and watch howard stern because they talked real dirty and they did stuff like that on there anyways he went on howard stern y'all and i cannot even show y'all have to go online and look it up or go watch the documentary that i was telling you about on amazon the lorena documentary and then you would see videos because it is so explicit what all howard stern was doing on there they, they had this giant member like a giant member that was like a meat like i don't know like a, a meter thing and there were people that were calling in and donating money for john bobbitt to get surgery down there to get extended i can't make this stuff up i, I just can't make this stuff up this is really what happened and so every time somebody would call in this long, giant, like eight foot giant eggplant would like go up like beep, 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 beep. And then there was like a woman standing there and just like a bikini bottom with her breasts hanging out and everything. And she was like rubbing on the member every time it moved up. I'm like, what, what? Anyways, they raised almost $200,000 y'all. And this is back in the 1990s. That's like to have him surgery to get an extension. It would be Howard Stern that would do some junk like this. Like, oh, he got his, he got his thing cut off. All right, I'm gonna get him, I'm gonna get him a giant one or something. I, I don't know. Nevertheless, he had the surgery and then did another prano in 1996 called Franken Penis. <laughs> how do I do this and be mature? I mean, how? How? Anyways, so like I said, he's living in Vegas as last of last year and she's living with her 20 year plus relationship and having a relationship with her daughter and that's where they're at today. Now I find it interesting because when I heard this story years ago when I was a kid, I mean like there were so many rumors about this. The thing that I always thought it was, was a woman walked in and found her husband with another woman and she chopped it off and then the dog, the woman was walking the dog and they found it and that was not the story at all. It was actually a story of a traumatized, battered woman who lost her mind for a second and chopped it off and then he really did go off and make all these videos afterwards like franken penis no god please no anyways what do y'all think have y'all heard about this before when you heard about it was it the story that you guys are hearing now have you seen the documentary what do you think let me know in the comment section down below as always my loves thank you so so much for watching this video if you made it to the end Please don't forget to like this video. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Love you guys. Bye.